This city of extremes has been the most overpopulated place in the world, an elegant cultural capital, and a disease-ridden city notorious for its filthy streets. This is Edinburgh, the only British city built on a volcano. Looking down from the castle, you get a fabulous idea of the geography of Edinburgh. And our journey is going to take us from the humble medieval origins through the bustle of 18th century ideas and inventions to the modern capital city of today. Punctuality has always been important for the people of Edinburgh, and so the second Astronomer Royal for Scotland invented the perfect time signal, the one o'clock gun. I think that must have been it, but I can't hear anything at all now. I do like to start programmes off with a bang. Now the chap responsible for firing the gun is Shannon the Cannon. That's a very smart name you've got there. Um, how long have people been firing guns here? The time gun or the time signal been fired in Edinburgh is 446 years this year. It's been getting fired since 1861. And tell me, what sort of gun is this? It's a 105 millimeter, which is in service with all NATO forces at the moment. It first saw service with the British Army during the Falklands War, and it's just progressed ever since. That's the one that the guys use just now in most conflicts. And and are you aiming at the tax office? No, I'm actually aiming out. Um, there's an island which we tell the tourists used to be four and a half thousand feet high, but over the years we've wore it down. <laughs> uh, which is basically fun. points towards the sea because the original design of the time gun was to let ships' captains know um, a correct time. So obviously in the old days, uh, not everybody had a watch because it was an expensive piece of equipment, but a ship's captain had a chronometer. But in order for him to use his chronometer, he has to have an accurate time signal to start with. And this is the idea of the one o'clock gun. The one o'clock gun. Great. Well, thanks very much. It's, I think, about time that I went and looked at something else. Yes, absolute pleasure. Cheers. Bye. Take care. On the east coast of Scotland, by the Firth of Forth, Edinburgh is one of the most beautiful capitals in Europe. And this medieval castle remains its most celebrated building and a breathtaking landmark. The big lump of volcanic rock on which it sits is where Edinburgh's story began. This fantastic location first drew people to it in prehistoric times. When the castle was eventually built, the population grew, the inhabitants safe in its shadow. Since the first reference to the fortress on the rock, nearly one and a half thousand years ago, the castle has provided the backdrop to many fierce battles between the English and the Scots but it's only been captured twice. In the most dramatic episode, Robert the Bruce's men scaled this 260-foot rock face to take their enemy by surprise. I want to discover some of the juicier secrets of this wonderful castle, so I've come to meet Duncan McCallum, who's been working here for years and knows all there is to know. Duncan, where are you taking me first? Welcome to Edinburgh Castle. Thank I think you. We'll go up and have a look at the honours of the kingdom. The honours. The Scottish Crown Jewels. Oh, great! Excellent. Okay. No, I'm so sorry. Sorry, no cameras in here because uh, they've had things pinched before. These are the castle's most valuable treasures, and to prevent any would-be jewel thieves getting ideas, camera crews aren't allowed in here. And with good reason, one of the items here has been stolen twice before. But it's not made from gold or jewels, it's a 150 kilogram lump of stone. The Stone of Schoon is the ultimate symbol of Scottish identity, and the coronation stone for the country's kings and queens. The English King Edward I pinched the stone from Scotland over 700 years ago and kept it at Westminster Abbey, where it remained until it made headline news in 1950 when it was mysteriously stolen again. They came only for the stone. 
They vanished into the night through this door. Despite a massive police search, the stone's location remained a mystery until the culprits, three Scottish students, turned themselves in. Fifteen weeks after it disappeared from Westminster Abbey, where for 650 years it formed part of the throne of coronation, the Stone of Scone, which was wrenched from here on the night of Christmas Eve, has returned to the light of day. The stone went back to Westminster Abbey, where it remained until 1996, when it finally made a triumphant return to the castle. We've seen some of the main sites, but Duncan has very kindly promised to take us behind the scenes to some of the hidden spots that are off limits to the general public. Wow, it's dark in here. Dark and gloomy. Where have you brought me to? I've brought you into David's Tower, uh, one of the remaining medieval parts of Edinburgh Castle, and this is the lower level of David's Tower. Right. This long-forgotten corner of the castle proved to be a very useful hiding place a few hundred years later. During the Second World War in 1941, the Scottish Crown Jewels were taken from the Crown Room in Edinburgh Castle, right. undercover, in darkness, and hidden in the toilet through night. No, I don't believe it. Could we go and have a look? Yes, certainly. Literally in this very room? Yes, down the toilet there. Oh, fantastic. Wow. From medieval times, the castle was the seat of Scottish military power, and the road that leads down from it was the heart of everyday life in the city. It's called the Royal Mile because it connects the castle at one end with the glorious Holyrood Palace at the other. As you walk down here, you see a city built out of stone, block by block, and the masons and architects who built along this road had a serious obstacle to contend with. During the 15th and 16th centuries, the city was encircled by a defensive wall to keep out attackers, but it also hemmed in the inhabitants, and the Royal Mile quickly became very overcrowded. They couldn't build outwards, so there was only one solution, build upwards. It was a sort of medieval Manhattan. This was the world's first high-rise living. Stonemasons erected buildings of up to 14 storeys, unheard of at the time. To build these towering houses required craftsmanship of the highest order. There was no margin for error. Any mistake would send these early skyscrapers crashing to the ground. And just as many of these buildings have survived, so has the craft that made them possible. Graham Brown is the Chief Masonry Instructor at the Scottish Lime Centre Trust. Graham, what are we going to do to this stone? Um, basically, we're going to take all the, the rough, rubble face of the stone, dress it right down to a, a nice ashlar, ashlar face. Ashlar? Ashlar face. That means flat, does it? A nice flat face, you, yeah. Can we get it as good as this? We can near enough, yes. Really? Yeah. OK. So how do we start? Um, basically, there's all different gauges of tools, uh, but we'll start off with a pincher to take all the... the a the, pincher? Pincher, yeah. Right. And what it basically does is it takes the, the, the weight off the, the stone, the okay. stone that's not going to be used. Show me. So basically... Uh, above the line. We're above the line at the moment, and it will just... And wallop it. Wallop and straight through. Okay. Well, do you think up. I could do that? Yeah. The only, now this time, when you come, just hold it at a slighter angle, and just a pitch up. Oh, I see, so OK. Not, down, down. not going down. down go. yeah. And it's a better idea to hit the tool than your hand. Definitely. Right, OK. You better make sure I'm doing it right. Oh! I get it. Look, look, I got a bit off. Fantastic. We've practically got this stone dressed already. It goes easily, doesn't it? Like this? Yeah, that's exactly it. With each stage in the process, Graham uses finer tools to dress the stone with increasing precision until, in the last step, he uses a chisel to smooth the stone's surface. It takes half a day to prepare a single stone. It doesn't bear thinking about the patience it would have taken to finish just one of the tenements in the old town. An average building there contained over 2,000 of these stones. <laughs> well, if you look, 
it's all beautifully even along there, and then suddenly it stops being beautifully even. Yeah. Clearly, I think Graham had, you know, scuppered me by blunting the chisel or something. The craftsmen who plied their trade here hundreds of years before Graham tried to outdo each other, building ever higher tenements. But however many stories they attempted, they couldn't solve Edinburgh's underlying problem, lack of space. However, one of the side effects of this chronic overcrowding saw the city become the site of an exceptional social experiment. Local historian Des Brogan has studied what life was like in the old town. Edinburgh um, is absolutely unique because we had all three social classes, if you like, within the one building. And you had on the ground floor here, you had the ordinary working people, right. um, many of them who had businesses that uh, opened onto the street. And because in those days, sanitation was very poor and all the rubbish, the offal was thrown out from the windows, then that was the best place for the ordinary local poor people to live, yeah, right next yes. to that. In the middle part of the buildings, you had the upper classes. And in the very top, you had the, the middle classes. So you had your artisans, you had your lawyers and so on, all within the one place. And uh, as a result of that, you have what was called the democratic tradition of Scotland being developed. All three social classes living within the one area. This social melting pot helped Edinburgh flourish and become a world famous city of ideas. By the 18th century, it was somewhere inventors and philosophers could mix freely, discuss ideas and debate new theories. Philosopher David Hume, economist Adam Smith and scientist Joseph Black changed the world and saw Edinburgh become the birthplace of modern economics, sociology and many other revolutionary developments. Strange to think that these tenement buildings contributed to so many of the ideas we take for granted today. As the city developed, people didn't only live sky high. A mysterious subterranean world also emerged where disease and death were never far away. Today, Edinburgh is a clean, civilized capital city. But a few hundred years ago, the streets of the old town hid a dark and mysterious secret a ghostly, subterranean world of death and disease. I've come to one of these underworlds to uncover its secrets. This is Mary King's Close. It's quite dark and a bit spooky and very rough underfoot, but luckily the chap who knows all about it is Stephen Spencer. Stephen, hi. Hello. What, what was this place? Well, Adam, this was one of the busiest shopping streets in Edinburgh. Shopping street? That's right. This was the Prince's Street of its day. <laughs> but it ain't underground. Uh, in 1753, the council decided to build on top of it. That was a bit desperate, wasn't it? Well, they were desperate to change the fact that the streets were completely um, disgusting as environments in which to live. Um, human waste and all kinds of other sewage was running down the streets. There were all kinds of mercantile activities going on, as well as probably criminal activities as well. It wasn't a place that you'd want to go on a dark night. So how did a street teeming with so much life end up underground? Owing to lack of space on the Royal Mile, Old buildings had to be knocked down and built over to make room for any new constructions. In the 1750s, the council chose four streets, including Mary King's Close, as the location for the Royal Exchange Building. And they used the existing houses there as the foundations. This created a strange twilight underworld, and many residents continued to live here many years after the close had been covered up. The last underground resident here, a sawmaker, only left in 1912. But before it was covered up, life here would have been very different. In the 1700s, Edinburgh was the most overcrowded city in the world. Huge numbers of people crammed into skyscraping tenement buildings and the poor would have lived in filthy conditions at street level, in places just like Mary King's Close. This is uh, what was known as a lay house or lay house. Um, maybe up to 12 people lived in here. Wow. 
Um, the only light they would have had would have been um, crazy lamps using fish oil, which oh. would have obviously been very smelly. Yes, horrible. And just to add to the smell would have been in the corner what we call the bucket of nastiness. Oh, yes. Into which all waste products... Um, all right, all right, we don't, we don't have to go... <laughs> into, yeah. And uh, once a day, um, there would have been the cry of Gardy Lou, and the waste bucket would have been emptied out into the street. <laughs> oh. All those people squashed in together, made for horrendous living conditions where disease was rife. And in the mid 17th century, the city was devastated by plague. It spread throughout Edinburgh and killed half the city's inhabitants. Legend has it that in Mary King's Close, plague victims were bricked up in their homes and left to die. In fact, they were tended to by people with the most dangerous job in the world, the plague doctors. Dressed from head to toe in a cloak and wearing a beak, they would have cut fearsome figures, but by lancing boils, they would have successfully treated half their patients. Oh, very fetching. <laughs> quack, quack. <laughs> well, no, it's interesting that you should say quack. Um, this mask is actually the origin of the term quack, meaning a doctor. Oh, really? Indeed. <laughs> but what's the point of it? Well, the, the point, literally, <laughs> is that um, these masks were filled with herbs and spices. Um, people believe that the plague was spread by miasmas or airborne vapours. Hor horrible smells, That's yes. That's right, okay. probably emanating from the Loch. Right. Um, so they wore the masks to actually keep out those vapours and protect them from the plague, along with their long leather hooded coat and uh, Le Leather, hat. top to toe. That's right. Um, but they were actually doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, because the plague was actually borne by fleas on rats. Um, so, of course, although the herbs and spices did nothing to protect them, the costume did. It kept the fleas away, and that was the main thing. Ah. And uh, they were, of course, incredibly well paid um, doing such a hazardous job. Um, probably the equivalent of what a premiership footballer would be earning really? today. Even after the plague outbreak had ended, Edinburgh's problems continued. Overcrowding had made the city notorious throughout Europe for its filth and squalor. Edinburgh needed to clean up its act. This whole area was known as the Nor Loch, and it was not just a rubbish pit, it was full also of raw sewage. The smell was said to be so awful that it gave people hallucinations. In the 16th century, it was decreed that all fornicators should actually be ducked in the Nor Loch. That really would have been a, a fate worse than death. And fornicators weren't the only ones to suffer the horrors of the Nor Loch. In the 15th and 16th centuries, women accused of witchcraft were regularly tied up and thrown in. No surprise then that when the cesspit was finally drained in 1763, many corpses were reportedly found. It took 1,501,000 wheelbarrow loads of dirt to drain the loch. And all that dirt didn't go to waste, creating the mound, the site for the National Gallery, the Royal Scottish Academy, and the old headquarters for the Bank of Scotland. It was well worth the effort though, because we now have these lovely Princess Street Gardens, which were first opened to the public in 1851 at the request of the Scottish Society for the Suppression of Drunkenness. They hoped that the gardens would tempt people out of the pubs at Christmas and New Year. Well, the Hogmanay celebrations are still centred here, but they're perhaps not quite as abstemious as the society might have wished. After the loch was drained, the next step in transforming Edinburgh was taken. The city fathers applied to extend Edinburgh beyond its defensive walls, and a competition was held in 1766 to find the right design for the new town. Eventually, the work of 22-year-old James Craig was chosen. His grid design featured gleaming straight roads and spacious gardens, a stark contrast to the dirty, winding roads of the old town. This revolutionary piece of urban planning was also a political statement, a show of support for the recent union of England and Scotland. Even the street names reflected allegiance to the king in the south. 
This new town gave the people who lived here a wonderful new commodity, space. This is probably the highlight of it, Charlotte Square. And to design this, they brought in the most famous architect of the day, Robert Adam. Robert Adam was the architect of many spectacular buildings across the UK, all built in his signature neoclassical style. From churches to stately homes, he was the Norman Foster of his day. One of the houses here was home to wealthy aristocrat John Lamont and his family, typical residents of Edinburgh's new town. Does what was life like for those Georgians? Oh, this was wonderful living here in comparison with what it had been in the old town, which was cramped and overcrowded and smelly and dirty. Just look, look at the, the room that we're in just now. You'd fit several houses in this room, indeed, wouldn't you? Indeed. Yes. Indeed. And in fact, it was only one family. It, it, the Lamont family stayed here. Uh, and although there were only four in the family, they would have had even more servants than there were numbers <laughs> of other people. Now, I'm really intrigued by this table here, um, which, which, what is this? Well, this, in fact, is more than a table. Um, it's a, a piece of furniture that was actually a, a produced by Edinburgh carpenters, but this also is where tea was looked after. Right. Because tea in those days was extremely expensive, very highly taxed. Only the, the rich, the aristocracy, could right. afford the tea. And here, what you had was a little container for black tea, a little container for green tea, and one where you could mix the two of them together. Right. And to make sure that the servants didn't get their fingers on it, this table was locked <laughs> securely. You lock up the tea. Indeed. Oh, wonderful. Oh, that's very good fun. And what about this potpourri here, this, this bowl of, of flowers? Was that just for decoration? No, it has very practical purpose. Although this is a very grand house, no matter where you go, which floor you go to, you will not find a toilet and you will not find a bathroom because in those days they still didn't have piped water supply into the house. And if they didn't have piped water supply, then people didn't wash properly. So you had to disguise the fact that there were lots of people in this room and perhaps smelling. A lot, I would say, yes. having your potpourri. And also your perfume burners up here. Right. In place as well. Oh, really? And also, this, what looks like a long poker, right. was used to uh, burn perfume in order to mask the unpleasant human smells. Yes. Uh, maybe they all wore clothes pegs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the socialising and entertaining that dominated life here couldn't happen without the hard graft taking place downstairs. Below the genteel surroundings of the drawing room and the family living quarters, the servants worked exhausting hours to cater for their employers. What were conditions like for the servants? Uh, they were very uh, hard worked, the servants. Uh, most of them worked a kind of 15, 16 hour day. And for that, um, an average servant would earn eight pounds a year. Eight pounds a year? Indeed. How many would there have been? Uh, probably about eight. And the difficulty was you didn't have enough accommodation for all of these servants. Some, if they lived nearby, would be able to go home. Others just had to find spaces um, wherever they could. Not um, very comfortable then. Indeed not. Uh, one uh, gentleman in one of the houses further along here uh, had to sleep under the stairs. By the 19th century, Edinburgh's reputation as a city of elegance and culture had spread far and wide, earning a new nickname, the Athens of the North. And it had no greater ambassador than this man, Sir Walter Scott. The literary superstar of his day, the most widely read English language author, and the man who revived Scottish heroism and folklore in his books. No wonder then that they built this spectacular monument in his memory. I reckon if I get up the 287 steps to the top, I'll need a heroic character to bring me back to life. It's a wonderful thing designed by a joiner called George Kemp, who entered a competition under an assumed name and won. And it's decorated with dozens of statues. There are 16 big statues of Scottish poets, including Robbie Burns, and 64 smaller ones of the characters in Scott's novels, including Friar Tuck, Richard Lionheart, and Robert the Bruce. And they're scattered all around the walls here. It's wonderful. All right, I'll try for the top. 
but its appearance has changed dramatically over the years. People often ask why the Scott Monument is black, and the same question can be asked of many other buildings in Edinburgh, like the National Art Gallery and the old post office at the east end of Princes Street. Well, the answer is they were all built of binny sandstone, which is a fine building material, but it contains a small amount of shale. That's this stuff, just buried within the sandstone. Over time, oil inside the shale gradually oozed out and collected soot and grime. I'm going to try and show that the shale contains oil by heating some over this gas stove. I'm hoping that this will produce an oil residue on the lid of the pan. The same principle was put to good use by a Scot called James Paraffin Young, who patented the process of cracking shale mined from the quarries just outside Edinburgh to produce paraffin and lamp oil. His discovery led to a booming industry that provided London with 60% of its lamp oil and remained an important part of the local economy until the 1960s. Now, let's see how it's getting on. Wow, look at that. Oh, fantastic. Just look at that oil there. That is amazing. Maybe I should go into the business. Although the Scott Monument's looks were tarnished, Edinburgh's beauty remains unquestionable. In the 19th century, these breathtaking views saw Edinburgh residents go crazy for an invention that turned the world upside down. In a beautiful city full of sweeping views, it's no surprise that locals found new and ingenious ways of experiencing Edinburgh's dramatic landscape. One such device first gave locals a unique perspective of their city over 150 years ago, and it's still fully functioning here in the heart of the old town. This is the camera obscura. I'm up on top of a building and I'm looking here at the building across the road, this white building. But the wonderful thing is that I can change the viewpoint just by twiddling this knob here. This must have astonished people when it was first built 150 years ago to see moving images because film didn't come in for another 50 years and even still photographs were, were brand, brand new. When light hits the mirror swiveling round on top of the building, it reflects the light downwards through three lenses to produce an image on the table below. Now, it was actually invented, the camera obscura, about a thousand years ago by an Arab who was living in Egypt at the time. He was called Al Hazen. And his uh, camera obscura, it just means a dark room, camera, room, obscura, dark. His was just a dark room with a little hole in one wall. And light came in through the hole and made an image on the opposite wall. Now, the image was upside down, but it was still a moving image of what was going on outside. It was popularised in Edinburgh by the celebrated town planner Patrick Geddes in the 1890s. He called this building Outlook Tower and saw the camera obscura as an important way of getting the city's residents to understand the relationship between the different parts of their city, the town and the country, the old town and the new. The experience of seeing all this shocked locals so much that Geddes had a darkened meditation room for visitors to go to afterwards where they could sit down and reflect on their experience. And one of the other silly tricks you can play is if you don't like the look of that van uh, part there, for example, I can pick it up on my card and just take it away and the street is empty. Or I can pick up this chap who's walking there and lift him away. Is it going to hurt if I drop him? <laughs> and I just think it's absolutely wonderful. Someone else who helped locals take a good look at their city was Robert Barker, an Irish painter who settled in Edinburgh in the mid-1700s. After taking a walk on Colton Hill one day and with the city laid out before him, Barker decided to make a 360-degree picture of what he saw. This style of painting already existed, but Barker's great innovation was how it could be viewed. His idea was to hang the painting on the inside wall of a circular building, 
and have spectators stand in the middle while the picture revolved round them. Spectators would feel, in Barker's words, as if on the very spot. He called his invention the panorama, from the Greek pan meaning all and horama meaning view. He built a prototype and took out a patent in 1787. His first public demonstration took place a year later in Edinburgh Castle. Barker refined and developed his new technique using bigger paintings and huge rotundas, the circular buildings in which viewings were held. He opened a venue in London in Leicester Square where viewers were admitted via a spiral staircase to a central gallery to view massive scenes of 20 by 40 metres. This new visual entertainment spread across London and Europe and remained popular until 1900. It was an immersive experience, the first form of virtual reality and a forerunner of cinema, all inspired by a view of Edinburgh. Many influential and famous people have lived in this wonderful city and a great host of them are buried right here in Greyfriars Cemetery. Just look at these magnificent memorials along the wall here. But the curious thing is that the most famous of all wasn't actually a person but a small furry dog, commonly known as Greyfriars Bobby. He belonged to a night watchman called John Gray. Now in 1858, sadly, John Gray died of tuberculosis and he was buried right here and Bobby remained loyal and every day he would come here and sit by his master's grave. And it actually says here, John Gray died 1858, old jock, master of Greyfriars Bobby. And the legend has become so strong that several Hollywood movies have been made about Greyfriars Bobby. One of my favourites dates back to 1945. Bobby starred alongside B-movie legends Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. Now, now, laddie, I only wanted to be friendly. He'll no leave the grave. Not since the wedding's did last, when we buried the lad. Your son, ma'am? He must have been a fine lad for the wee dog to love him so. Aye, a fine lad he was. But he wasn't just a money spinner for Hollywood movie producers. According to legend, this faithful hound would sit by the grave all morning until it heard the one o'clock gun, and then it would trot off for lunch. And the place it trotted off to was this pub just round the corner. And the landlord, of course, gave it lunch, and then he realised he could cash in on the legend, and so he renamed the pub Greyfriars Bobby's Bar. And no doubt that was to the mutual advantage of the pub and the legend. This display of canine loyalty saw Bobby receive the freedom of the city, and Edinburgh remains the only place in Britain to give this honour to a dog. He lived out his days well-fed and happy until he died peacefully in 1872, unlike in the 1945 film, where in a very loose interpretation of the tale, Bobby meets a rather more brutal end. Don't worry. It's only a film. Now, after all that drama, I'm hoping to find something in here to soothe my nerves. I'm in the White Hart in the Grass Market. This pub has been here since 1516. One constant in this ever-changing city is an appreciation of the amber nectar. Mm. It's been a part of the city's trade and indeed of its pleasure for at least 500 years. Early Scots drank grain-based brews often made from coarse barley cunningly flavoured with heather. A few pints of that stuff would no doubt have left you reaching for the aspirin. Beer brewing and whisky distilling in the city reached a peak in the 19th and 20th centuries when there were over 40 breweries and many distilleries here. Today, despite this rich tradition, Edinburgh's thriving brewing and distilling industry is long gone. There is, however, a reminder of the past still going strong just outside Edinburgh, the Glenkinchy Distillery. I'm looking forward to, to testing the good work they do here. They've been making whisky here since 1837, and for the last 100 years, the process has remained almost exactly the same. 
It all starts with good Scottish ingredients. Malted barley is steeped in water before being taken to the malting floor until green shoots appear. Then it's transferred to a peat-fired kiln to dry it out. The malt is milled before hot water is added and the mixture put in the mash tun and stirred. This releases the sugar in the malt into a solution which is then collected. To make whiskey, you need to make beer first, which is basically what's inside these big wooden containers where fermentation is taking place. So this is straight from the mash house. That's right. So this is basically just sugary water. That's right. And you with the yeast added. With the yeast. Yes. So you're making beer. Yes, at, at this the point. end of this point, right. we have a rough beer known right. as wash, which is about 9% alcohol. 9%? Nine percent. Oh, that's quite rough, <laughs> yes. Well, I wouldn't mind trying some of that. Yes. OK, what's next? Okay. So what happens in here? Well, this is fermentation. Just right. be careful because it is quite high at the moment. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's spraying <laughs> stuff is, out. This is a carbon dioxide gas that's produced. It's causing the liquid All to this drop flop. up inside like this. But there's something going round, yes, pushing it. it's a metal blade. Oh, it's just stirring. Right, keeping so. it in here. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, I think you can put that down again now. <laughs> These copper stills, among the biggest in the UK, distill the alcohol before it's transferred to barrels to mature. 1.3 million bottles are produced here every year. And across Scotland, 17 million barrels of whisky are maturing at this very moment. That's an awful lot of whisky. But where does it all go? You might think that most of it would be enjoyed locally. In fact, the French love a wee dram and import the greatest volume of whisky globally, while the Greeks drink the most per capita. Luckily, they do hang on to some of the stuff. You can see how it clear It looks the beautiful, is. yeah. Okay. And it's very slightly well, peaty looking, I mean brown anyway. What's the, that's not from the peat though, is it? Uh, no, it's just from the cask. From the cask. Yes. For decades, Scotch whisky has actually relied on the United States for its distinctive taste. It's aged in American bourbon barrels, which are used once only before being shipped over the Atlantic to places like this distillery. The long journey was well worth the effort. Just as whiskey's popularity has spread far and wide, this iconic landmark also made an impact. The first large steel bridge the world had ever seen. It's without doubt one of the greatest feats of Victorian engineering, and walking across it is completely terrifying. A city as important as Edinburgh obviously needed good transport links with the rest of the world, but unfortunately, just to the north of the city is the Firth of Forth, which cuts it off from the north and east of Scotland. So they decided to build a bridge, and this is it, the Forth Bridge. It's absolutely fantastic and said to be one of the wonders of the modern world. This breathtaking feat of engineering was the first large steel bridge the world had ever seen. It's 8,296 feet long and its towers rise 370 feet into the air. This immense structure is held together by six and a half million rivets, which alone weigh 4,200 tonnes. English engineer Sir Thomas Bouch first started work on the bridge in 1879. He had recently completed the construction of the Tay Bridge near Dundee and received a knighthood from Queen Victoria for his achievement. However, his reputation was shattered when high winds saw the Tay Bridge collapse, sending 75 people on board a passenger train to their deaths. In the fallout from the disaster, Bouch's plans for the fourth bridge were abandoned. Work started again on the bridge in 1883 with two new engineers in charge, Sir John Fowler and Benjamin Baker and a brand new design for a steel bridge of the utmost robustness. It was a huge undertaking. At one point there were 4,600 men working on the bridge risking life and limb. Recent estimates believe 96 people died, many more were horribly injured 
and during construction, boats circled underneath in hope of picking up anyone who tumbled into the water. It was finally finished after seven years. Now the point of the bridge is to hold up the railway line and you can see that going in a straight line right through the middle of it. And there are three main cantilever sections, one here, one there, one there. They're simple because they're resting on solid foundations, but in between them there is a suspended span, you see, with nothing holding it up. So this cantilever and that one have got to hold the middle bit up. Now when a train gets onto the middle there's terrific bending motion trying to tilt this whole cantilever down, and so to counteract it there's a massive weight in the end tower that balances the weight of the train sitting on that suspended span. I've got a model of it here. I've got here one of the cantilevers. Are you all right, cantilever? Yeah. Jolly good. And there's the massive weight at the end. And here is the suspended span. And here is the other cantilever. Are you okay? Yeah. Now, now brace yourselves, rigid, and another great weight at the other end. And if it all works, I should be able to sit here and lift my feet off the ground. Look, look. Hey! I'm on the suspended span, and those weights at the ends are taking my weight, balancing it, so I don't go crashing into the sea. So let's hope it'll work with trains going over the bridge. Well, as usual, as soon as I say I'm terrified of heights, the producer sends me up the highest thing he can find, in this case, the fourth bridge. I'm now 370 feet above the sea, which is just, just down there, and I'm not looking. And there are trains rattling past underneath. Here we are. Well, you get fantastic views from up here, and I'm going to go down in a minute and see what they're doing about painting the bridge. From the beginning, the upkeep of the bridge was a huge job. For a start, the bridge always needed a fresh coat of paint. By the time painting was finished at one end, it was already time to start again at the other, giving rise to the popular expression, like painting the fourth bridge, to describe a never-ending task. And I know what that feels like. Just walking across here feels never-ending. Luckily, the man I'm about to meet copes with heights much better than I do. He's been working on the project to coat the bridge in a revolutionary new paint, a glass flake epoxy, first tested on oil rigs. It should have a lifespan of 25 years and relegate the phrase, like painting the fourth bridge, to history. Oh, I didn't enjoy that very much. Anyway, to find out about the painting, I've come to meet Paul Kirtland, who's a painting supervisor. It must be very cold here in winter. I mean, it's quite cold now. It, it does affect, the weather does affect you dramatically here. Um, I think the worst I've experienced is about minus 17 on the wind chill. Minus 17. Well, you've got the flip side. Um, we had a, a heat wave a couple of years ago and it was sort of 38, 40 degrees inside. Oh. It's like sitting in a greenhouse. Could I do a bit? Certainly could. Then I can claim that I've painted the fourth bridge. Right, which, see. sorry, okay. which um, rivet would you like me to cover? You pick one and you This one? Any one you want. Right, have I got too much paint on? A little on? bit too much. Oh dear. Yeah, that'll do you fine. Right, I'm never a great painter. This one I said, yeah. didn't I? Right, just round like that. Right round, so we'll seal right round the river. Right, I'll do the one below as well. Yep. Yeah. There, and we've got evidence on film to show that I painted the fourth bridge. Now it's a bridge fit for the 21st century. And the city it serves has also changed to keep up with the times. In recent years, Edinburgh has undergone regeneration and many new buildings have sprung up in this most historical of cities. This is the building that put the stamp on Edinburgh as a city for the new millennium, the Scottish Parliament. It was built by the Spanish architect Enric Miralles and opened in 2004 to usher in a new era of Scottish independence. I've now come inside the building to meet the MSP for Edinburgh and Lothian, Robin Harper. Robin, tell me about this building. You love it, don't you? I absolutely love it, yes. It's a work of art. This is our debating chamber. Um, and one of the principal, I think, exciting things about it is the engineering uh, of the roof. The As roof's amazing. It. Yes. So you've got all those wooden beams coming downwards. What are they doing? Well, they're holding up the top of the roof and they're pressing downwards and they're slung on a sort of cat's cradle of steel bars which are attached to the side of the building. But if you go outside the chamber, you will see another set of 
steel bars, rather like the rigging of a ship, <laughs> which actually pull the building outwards right. and support the whole thing. Miranis filled the building with visual references to Scotland's history and culture. The boat roofs suggest the country's seafaring tradition. These window panels are supposedly inspired by one of the most famous Scottish paintings, the Reverend Walker ice skating at nearby Duddingston Loch by Henry Rayburn. Hmm, I think you really need to use your imagination to see that one. And many people believe these windows in the chamber are whiskey bottles. In fact, they represent the Scottish people keeping an eye on their politicians. If you look outside the building, the grass-covered roofs connect us to Salisbury crags absolutely directly so that the grass, if you like, on the roofs laps up against the walls of the parliament like the waves on the sea. You, you can see the meaning of the building, the way it fits in more and more. Morales' idea was that it should reflect something about Scotland, about the landscape, about what o occupies us. Practically anything and everything you can think of to do with the history of Scotland is either side of the Royal Mile as, as we go up, so it's absolutely the right place for a Parliament to be. The Parliament is a fitting final destination reaffirming Edinburgh's standing as a capital city and centre of political power. Edinburgh is flourishing elsewhere too. New buildings springing up alongside ones that have stood here for centuries. No real surprise in a city with a habit of continually reinventing itself. Modern Edinburgh is a centre for business and finance and plays host to the biggest arts festival in the world. The city's story continues to unfold. There's even a theory that America was named after a sheriff of Bristol, Richard Americk. Find out more about this West Country city when how Britain was built continues at the same time next Monday.